man, we got the sharks here. Two different species. It's like different of kinds of sharks, too. Yeah. What is that? It's a lemon shark. Lemon shark. Beautiful. I mean, just look how they move, I and mean, it's almost like effortlessly glide along. I wish I could swim like that. Engineers wish we could make boats like that. Yeah. Submarines that could move yeah. as efficiently as a shark. We can't quite do it. Well, Rob, this is all this is all amazing, and I think we need to we need to sit back for a second and talk about the paradigm that all of us hear. We hear it in schools. We hear it all over, and that's the whole notion of evolution. Uh, what is it, really, from your perspective? What, when people talk about evolution, what is it? How do you define evolution? The word means change over time, but I believe in change over time, but I'm not an evolutionist, so how does one figure this out? Really, evolution is a belief that enough change over time, over enough time, can lead to the common ancestry of all species okay. on Earth. All right. So that's the part I reject. Of course, species change. I mean, look at these sharks here. We have several different species of sharks. These things are subjected to natural forces that the environment is playing on them and natural selections operating on them and mutations happening in them. But there are still sharks. And when we look at the fossil record, there are still sharks. The sharks have been sharks and always are sharks. And they might be able to grow a slightly longer tail or a slightly smaller tail. But there's not going to be any radical change because what natural selection cannot do is change something a lot. It can just fine tune. Okay. So is that what you mean when you say you believe in change? Yeah, of course things change. We've seen things change. We can watch things change to a limited degree. What we don't see is the evolution of a new biochemical pathway or a brand new thing that is never seen before. There's, there's no mechanism in the natural world to do that. All we can do is take what already exists, tweak it a little bit, just a little bit. And so what we see when we look at the fossil record, oh well, yeah, things look like they were created, they survive for a time and either go extinct or we still have them today. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I believe that when God created the organisms on earth, he put into those organisms the ability to change, to adapt, to respond dynamically mm -hmm. to the environment. That includes adaptation to some limited degree. But what we cannot see in the natural world and what the standard paradigm of evolution will never be able to explain is how you get a brand new something from nothing. Because mm -hmm. the, the tweaking that we see, the little teeny changes, they don't explain the complexity of life. But what you're saying is that the, the changes that we do see are the changes that are already in the genetic plan. The, there are a lot of changes that are in, that are sort of like pre-programmed. Okay. Genetic diversity that God initially put in mm -hmm. to created organisms. And so over time, as traits are recombining through the normal process of, of reproduction, you can get things that look a little different from each other, from the natural diversity that God created. Mm -hmm. But we also have to factor in mutations. We're in a cursed world. Ever since Adam rebelled against God, things have been falling apart, things have been breaking down. And so there are bad mutations that do occur. When they're not lethal, they can persist in a population. Okay. But isn't the, the evolutionary theory based upon the fact that those mutations are what has taken us from that small little piece of life to all, all of Ab this? Absolutely. Evolutionary theory requires that small, random changes can explain everything we see. Mm -hmm. But it can't. And why can't it? Because of the complexity of life. Okay. Life is so complex that small changes can't explain it. Just like you can't take a computer operating system mm -hmm. and look at it and say, oh yeah, this is built up one digit <laughs> at a time right. over any length of time. No, it took an intelligent person to sit down and put it together. Well, I can guarantee you as one who was in that world that if anyone in the area of computer science were to say, if we just randomly change some things in this operating system, it'll get better. I mean, no one would agree with that. No. So if we're looking at a computer and we had a computer operating system, I, I don't know what. If you change one out of every 100 digits in there, one at a time, it might be survivable, maybe. 
It's hard to say. Uh, it's, it's really hard to put a number on right, that, isn't that's it? That's true. Same thing with mutations. There are a small number of allowable changes. A lot of changes are simply lethal. You'll never see it because the organism just dies. We don't have unlimited changeability. So when we already have an organism, we can tweak it. We can streamline it. We can help it. It can, you know, it'll reproduce faster or not faster. And the ones that reproduce the fastest, they're the ones that are going to have more children in the future. That's called natural selection. Mm -hmm. There's no problem with that. But we're not going to get the shark to evolve into a bird. We're not going to get the shark to evolve into a fish. The number of changes and the types of changes are not something that you can do one change at a time. So from your perspective as a marine biologist, and I know that you've studied the whole area of genetics a lot, yes. the notion of mutations and the positive aspect of mutations that evolutionary theory presents and the power of natural selection, from your perspective, they don't get us to here, is that correct? No, they don't. It's a funny thing, because when Darwin wrote The Origin of Species, he started with life already existing. He started with the greatest miracle in the entire universe was life. And then he tweaks it. But he thought life was simple. When we take complex life like this, okay, I'll give you that fish. This giant miracle has already occurred. The fish exists. Now evolve it into something else. And they won't be able to do it because the mathematics isn't with them. The, the, the process of mutation isn't with them. Mm -hmm. Everything we see actually happening in the natural world is arguing in the wrong direction. So all of the diversity then that we see is a diversity that God had already programmed and planned in the genetics that he created in the kinds, is that correct? Uh, yes, God created life with some design parameters. And as long as life doesn't exceed those parameters, it will continue to live. It doesn't mean that he put all of the diversity we see today in the initial creation, because mutations have occurred that have changed things. I mean, when we look in the fossil record, there are six foot tall penguins. We don't have six foot tall penguins anymore. The platypuses in the fossil record, the ones that are buried with dinosaurs, they're twice as big as modern platypuses. So things can absolutely change. But the types of change we see are really minor. So we don't get one kind becoming another kind. No. Mm -hmm. you know, people have heard the phrase, the missing link. Oh. And they usually think of between man and monkeys. No, there's missing links between almost every major group of animal and almost every other major group of animal and plant, even bacteria, throughout the entire fossil record. Mm -hmm. Which indicates very strongly that these are actually different creations. That is a remarkable picture of what God did in the very beginning, isn't it? Yes, it is. And it's also a wonderful thing for science to be able to say. Because science today backs up the idea that there was a creator, mm -hmm. that life is not millions of years old, that life did not evolve. And brought about these amazing creatures that we're seeing here in the tank. This is a sea urchin. It looks spiny. Yeah, it's pointy, you gotta be careful. It... Am I gonna get stuck over here? No, 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 he's pointy, but. Oh my goodness, they're, they're moving. Yes, they're moving. And in between <laughs> the spines are little tube feet, especially on the bottom. Look at that movement. So he oh walks goodness, with yeah. his spines, huh. but his little tube feet in here, and that's what he uses to grab onto things. He walk right up this wall, he can hold on when there's strong surf. What and that thing know? in the middle, mm -hmm. that's called the Aristotle's lantern. Oh, well, what That's what that he mean? eats with. It, it has teeth that grind and grind uh -huh. and grind. And he usually eats algae off rocks. So that's the mouth, huh? That's his mouth. It's really neat, amazing little design. There's teeth in there. And the teeth huh. can, can um, rasp on rocks. And so he will eat algae. He just scrapes the algae off. And you can see where these guys have been underwater because they'll leave a trail of nothing. Oh, just bare rock. These are very important oh. grazers in the coral reef ecosystem. And the sea urchins help the corals live by eating the algae that would cover and mm -hmm. smother the coral. But look, looking carefully, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are actually 10 radial parts to this animal. Huh. Well, it's a beautiful creature. Well, and it well, doesn't well, look anything like that starfish down there. Oh, the starfish. Actually, the starfish is his cousin. 
Are you serious? You can't be serious. Absolutely. The starfish here is also an echinoderm, but notice he has five-fold symmetry instead of uh -huh. 10. Yeah. This starfish does. On the bottom, look. We see the spines, we see the tube feet. His mouth is in the center there. Huh. So there is some similarity here, even similarity though externally it looks a lot different. A lot different. Actually, you want to see something that looks a lot different, sure. which is a cousin to the starfish and okay. the sea urchin. All right. It almost looks like a rock. Yes, yes. I got to be careful. He's squirting on me. This is a sea cucumber. Oh, he has spines. He has huh. two feet. Oh my goodness. You would never know it until you studied really hard that this also is an echinoderm. He's not very happy being out of the water, so let me put him back in. Yeah, so these are all related, even though they look very, very different. Related in their creation. Uh -huh. Not in an evolutionary sense, but our creator took this phylum of life, the echinoderms, and created this and this and this on a similar pattern. So when you say phylum of life, are you talking about a kind as we read in Genesis? I would say these are each three different created kinds here okay. within the phylum, echinoderms, which is part of the kingdom animalia. Okay, so... So within what? kingdom animalia, okay. we have the animals. Mm -hmm. One branch are the echinoderms. Okay. Another branch are things that make up corals and sea anemones. Another branch would be things with backbones, you and me and fish. Okay. So we're talking about the branches of the tree of life, the tree that God created, not in some evolutionary tree. How do we know these different branches? How do we know them? We've, we've studied them. We've looked around the world and all the different uh, environments, and scientists have collected, measured, preserved um, all these different forms of life. Mm -hmm. In fact, the most amazing thing about the oceans is that the oceans have more different types of life than any other environment. When we were on our dive yesterday, we saw phylum echinodermata. We saw sponges, which are another phylum. We saw fish, we saw algae. We saw an amazing diversity that you cannot see in any other environment on Earth other than a coral reef, because there's so much right on top of each other, all these wonderful, different forms that God created us. Well, who put all of that in those uh, forms? I mean, who studied that in the beginning to create all of those phylums? One of the great taxonomists in history is a man named Carl Linnaeus. He would call him the father of modern taxonomy. He gave us our naming system. So we are Homo sapiens. That is the name ascribed to people. Uh -huh. And it's called the binomial nomenclature. Binomial, two names. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the nomenclature is the way to name things. It's kind of funny yeah, how the yeah. nomos appears twice in that. But, but the not binomial nomenclature is our system of naming species. And Linnaeus came up with that? Uh, Linnaeus, it came up with our modern way of doing it. Okay. And so when we talk about echinoderms, that's in a classification system that he put together. But the funny thing is, Linnaeus was a creationist. Uh -huh. He believed that God created and he was going out and studying the diversity of life that God put on this earth. But it's really interesting the way things change over time. Because the evolutionists now have claimed that taxonomy is theirs. Hmm. They, they, have, they start with bacteria and they go up to more and more complex things over time in their evolutionary story. But Linnaeus is the one who organized it like that for us. Mm -hmm. He didn't believe in the evolution thing. And what's even more funny, more amazing, Linnaeus had a concept of species very similar to mine. See, because he read in the Bible about God creating different kinds of animals and plants and things, and, and that there was some reproductive barrier between this group and this group, but the Bible doesn't explain where the difference is. So he went out and he explored it, and he said, wow, the, all these species here, they can interbreed. So his definition of species was much broader than Darwin's definition 80, 90 years later. Darwin's view, species were very finely different from one another. So you can have a species of, of iguana and another species of iguana, and there's slight differences, they call them different species. Linnaeus wouldn't have thought that way. He would have given them two different species names, but he would have thought that they were still could interbreed because they're one created kind. So from Linnaeus' perspective, when he was talking about kinds from the scripture, 
Uh, is that what relates to the phylum? Um, actually, yes. But most creation biologists would put the created kinds at a lower level. Okay. So it's not the species level because gray wolves and red wolves, we give them different species names, but mm -hmm. they can interbreed. Mm -hmm. Domestic dogs can interbreed with them. Coyotes can interbreed with them. Australian dingoes and African jackals. That's one giant interbreeding what? We call them different species, but if they can all interbreed and have puppies that can grow up and interbreed with other things, there's no biological barrier between them. That's probably a created kind. So all the canines, the canidae, would be one created kind. Just like all the felidae, all the cats in the world are one created kind. It surprises people when they go to a zoo and they see a liger, which is hybrid between a lion and a tiger. So all members of the big cats, they can all interbreed. Now, I suspect big cats and little cats probably can, but you couldn't actually do it physically because like one would eat the other and right. you have problems with it. Yeah. But, yeah. but there's, there's these breaks between the living things that God created. Mm -hmm. And if we look at it biologically, it happens about the level of the taxonomic rank of family. Now there's some exceptions. But that's about where most of us would draw the lines between the kinds. Well, this is, I think, important because a lot of Christians, I think, have equated the notion of species with the kind that God made. And so they get confused when we see these uh, different species that are really all part of a kind. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, because, like the old question, how many animals did Noah have to take on Noah's Ark? Well, people have this concept of species. I mean, millions upon millions of animals. Right. But that's not what we're talking about. Maybe you've got a few thousand pairs of animals. It's actually a surprisingly small number of kinds that have to go on to Noah's Ark to preserve the lineages. So we only need to take uh, that high-level kind of a dog on Yeah. There.